you're not not still in your rooms recovering. Um, we're here to talk about what's in a major Postgres release. Now, before I start, can somebody in the back raise your hands and let me know if you can hear me okay? All right, awesome. Um, my name is Claire Giordano, and uh, I've done this collaboration with, well, I'll, I'll save that for a minute. We're going to talk about what's in a Postgres major release. And we've done an analysis of many of the contributions, not all, many, that happened in the Postgres 17 timeframe. Um, a bit about me. I've worked in Postgres since early 2017 when I joined a small San Francisco startup called, uh, oh, sorry, uh, called Citus Data that was later acquired by Microsoft. Um, and I love working in this community. But prior to that, I also worked in open source. I led the effort to open source the Solaris operating system. How many of you have used Solaris ever? We got a couple hands. Okay. Um, and uh, nowadays, I head up the community Postgres open source community initiatives team at Microsoft, uh, which is a lot of fun. And I get to host a podcast too. And I love that. Um, so there's all sorts of work happening um, in Microsoft and Postgres, but that's me in the bottom right where the PG community box is. Uh, my co-collaborator on this project is Daniel Gustafson. Uh, how many of you know Daniel? Show of hands. Okay, he is a major contributor and committer to Postgres. He's on the Postgres contributors team at Microsoft too. Uh, organizer of Nordic PG Day since it started in 2014 and an all around brilliant human being. Um, he can't be here today, uh, but our plan was to do this research together and then I get to give a talk and he gets to write a deep dive of a blog post. So um, if you don't like talks or you don't like me, you can leave now and you can read Daniel's blog post later. Um, once it's written. So uh, gratitude is a thing. And uh, for coming. Um, I just said thank you. Uh, but I also want to say thank you to all of the people who were involved in organizing, doing talk selection for, volunteering, being on the code of conduct team, speakers, sponsors. Like we wouldn't be here without all of you. But when I did the count, I was amazed to see there were more than 140 people involved in making this happen for everyone in the audience. Um, so where did this talk come from? Uh, every year for the last, I'm not sure how many years, Robert Haas, a uh, Postgres uh, major contributor, has written a blog post called Who Contributed to Postgres Development? Um, and the most recent one was published early this year, at, reflecting back on the last calendar year. And it has some really nice charts in it that this is a screenshot of one of the charts about um, how many new lines of code were contributed and that 90% of them were contributed by 50 people. This is only the top 30. I, I couldn't, the fonts would have been too small if I tried to fit all 50 of them in here. Um, but it's, it's really interesting to kind of, if you've been working on it, if your friends have been working on it, to see your name up in lights and you know, to get your contribution recognized in that way. But Daniel and I started to wonder, as I was thinking about PGConfU and what would be interesting for people to learn about, um, what if we cut the numbers by the entire Postgres 17 development timeframe? Um, what if we looked at contributions beyond code? Uh, what, what are the shape and the size of the code commits? Are there any like notable ones that we want to call out? Are there unsung heroes? We had all these questions. So we decided to organize some of this information about all the contributions that happened in this time frame. And we came up with this wheel and to create chapters for the talk. So all the different sections, if you will, of what we're going to cover. And we'll start with organize, and then we'll go into publishing, engaging. Hacking is where you'll see a lot of the code and documentation contributions. And then we'll talk about funding because that's super important too. We all have to eat after all. So uh, the time frame for this analysis starts with this uh, commit by Tom Lane that happened on June 29th, 2023, last year. So, and, and then we end around the GA of Postgres 17. So we all know that was September 26th. I, I actually cut the data through September 30th uh, to include PGConf New York City um, because I wasn't sure when we started the analysis exactly when the Postgres 17 GA would be. It's always a little tiny bit unpredictable as to which day. So um, the other exception we made is there's a lot of collaboration between the contributors and the committers at the PGCon, now called pgconf.dev, uh, annual conference that happens most every year, COVID notwithstanding, in Canada. 
And so we knew there were a lot of PG-17 collaborations happening at PGCon, which was in May 2023. So we included that as well. All right. So from a, just, I need to get the basics over. Otherwise, you guys will stop listening to me and you'll want to kind of nitpick the numbers as we go through. Um, but I told you the dates. Um, Daniel Gustafson created a new open source tool um, that enabled him to do some pretty interesting analysis on the Git commits. It's called, what's it called? Let me see if I can get it right. Ekora. Kora, um, which has something to do with squirrels in Swedish. If Magnus were here, he could probably explain to us. But um, some people were assuming that all of this analysis was based on automated data collection. I can assure you, it was not. This was incredibly manual and tedious because the data about the contributions is all over the place. It's unstructured. It's really hard to get to. Links are broken. There are 404 pages. There are websites that are taken down after the fact. I mean, it, it was actually kind of tedious. So, But we did try to limit ourselves very hard. There's only a few exceptions to online public information. Um, obviously, to get commit logs, but um, PostgreSQL.org has a wealth of information about the various teams and committees, the mailing lists, of course, meetup pages for user groups, LinkedIn to try to figure out country and company. Um, and that's complicated, too, because a, a, quite a number of people changed companies during the 16-month period of Postgres 17. So if I want to understand, well, which companies have people contributing, well, that, that answer gets a little fuzzy. All right. So we're going to start with Organize. Um, and I've changed my mind, Dave. I do want a 30-minute reminder when I get to 30 minutes. Thank you. All right. So in the organized bucket, we looked at boards of directors, code of conduct, uh, the core team, which you probably heard about um, in Stacy's keynote at the beginning of this conference. Um, we also looked at event organization um, and user groups. And let's start with the nonprofit organizations. So the four recognized nonprofit organizations that you can find out about on PostgreSQL.org um, are these four. And uh, so PGEU is behind this conference that we're attending. But there's also a lot of activity in the PGUS board. There's the Slonic Events Canada board, which I believe um, is responsible for pgconf.dev, that developer um, event that I mentioned a few moments ago. And then PGCA, which I'm giving a lightning talk about later today, um, is the board that's responsible for shepherding um, the trademark assets and the brand assets associated with Postgres. And uh, if we look at who the 16 people are that serve on these 21 different board seats, and those numbers are not equal because there are a few people who serve on multiple different nonprofit boards for Postgres, um, I wanted to put their names up in lights here too. And then from Code of Conduct, that was interesting because I knew there was a Postgres Code of Conduct team and I put the names up there. And of course, the people changed during this time frame. So I also included some past members who were on the Code of Conduct team in this time. But I also realized that, wow, the, the general Code of Conduct team is responsible for a lot of the community events, but a few of the conferences have specific Code of Conduct teams too. So I grabbed those names and captured them here. And also wanted to give a shout out, even though this conference is not part of the analysis, because we're in October, um, shout out to the people who were involved in that, that enable us to be here. Then there's the Postgres core team. All of these wonderful people gave me permission to use their biopics. You've heard about them before. But what some people just don't realize, the work they do is invisible, and it's behind the scenes. And uh, they're not driving the roadmap for Postgres, but they are helping when help is needed. They are steering. Um, although over time, a lot of the day-to-day -day work has been delegated uh, to other teams and other committees. So it's been interesting to see the core team evolve over time. But I wanted to say a big thank you to um, all seven of these wonderful Postgres people. And then for conferences, I grabbed this beautiful picture from uh, PG Day Lowlands that happened just last month. I couldn't be there, but they had a professional photographer, and I thought the pictures were amazing. Um, so let's dive into conferences for a minute. Um, these, this map is a bit of an eye chart. I'm guessing you cannot read the text from the back of the room. I made it as big as possible, but I wanted to kind of get a sense of how global the conferences were. Um, it was really tricky to decide what to include and what to not include. So this is not user groups. These are only conferences in the 
PG-17 timeframe, um, only conferences that are listed in the PostgreSQL.org events pages. So if you're not listed there, it didn't make this cut. Um, and the conference website had to exist when the data was collected, which we started in July, so July and August. So what that means is there were some EDB vision events that I know happened and that were listed, but those web pages are just gone. They don't exist anymore. So I couldn't capture any of that data. Um, FOS4G as well, they replace their website every year. Uh, Postgres Conference Silicon Valley wasn't listed on PostgresQL.org. Um, we discovered some events that we didn't even know about, like PG Day Curitiba. Anybody speak Portuguese? I don't know if I said that right. Did I say it right? Okay. All right, tell me later, okay? Um, PG Day Seoul. I mean, these are events that are not listed but got discovered as part of the user group analysis. So um, there were also a few events there that were listed as events, but they were like a one-hour meetup. So we did not include those two. It had to include an equivalent of a full day's worth of learning. Um, we did include virtual events like PostGIS Summit, um, that is happening again soon for this year, I think, um, maybe next month, and Posette, um, which my team organizes at Microsoft, and Teresa's sitting in the front row. All right, and so then we wondered, is there a Postgres conference season? And as you might expect, um, the conferences slow down around the December timeframe, and they also slow down kind of the middle of Northern Hemisphere summer. So like July and August. So those are the two vertical empty spaces that you see here. Um, but otherwise, there's always conferences happening in Postgres, which is kind of heartwarming to see. And uh, then we wondered, well, how do these things get organized? How many people served in these conference organizing roles? So this uh, histogram tries to, we counted 239 organizing roles for these 29 conferences, and there were 130 people that wore these hats in this time frame. And the vast majority of them, 74, just had one organizing role, obviously, in one event. But there were six people who served on five or more different organizing or talk selection teams, because I included the program committees, the talk selection, uh, because that is, while it doesn't span the whole duration of the event, um, it's very intense and very important work, right? They're the ones who decide who's, who's up on stage. Um, so those six people, Andrea Sherbaum, Chris Ellis, Daniel Gustafson, Jonathan Katz, Magnus Sagander, and Vic Fearing. I wanted to put your name in big font and, and give a shout out. But there were lots of other people whose names are up here too, who are also participating and helping organize, helping bring us together in many events. Um, now, because it's a 16 month period, that means there are a few events that show up twice. So you're gonna see some of the organizers' names on here who are behind Swiss PG Day, for example. Well, that's because there were two Swiss PG Days that happened. Um, it's an annual event, it happens in June, so there were two of them that kind of um, inflated their numbers a slight tiny bit. All right, and then we also looked at committees and we grabbed all the names of the contributors committee, the funds group, the sponsors group, all of this information is available on postgresql.org. But these are unsung heroes. Some of you might not know some of these people, but the work they're doing is really important. And I'm looking at Corey's first name in the third column and it's missing right above Rob Treat, so I better fix that. All right. So then we looked at user groups, and at first we thought, okay, the user group data is spread out. There's no way we can possibly pull it together. But then I went to postgresql.org, has a lovely user group page, it has a list. We went to every single one of the links for those meetups. And what I found interesting here is that for the meetups and the user groups, there's a huge number of members for many of these um, user groups. So for example, uh, let's grab, Postgres user group Netherlands, 888 uh, members, and they had four meetings during the year. I think that's three plus PG Day Lowlands. Um, the user groups are often involved in those local PG Days. So to me, this just spelled, wow, opportunity. Now, I did not include user groups on this chart if they did not have a single meeting during this 16-month time frame. So there are a whole bunch of user groups that kind of I don't know, went on pause during COVID, we think, um, and they haven't really sprung back to life yet. Um, at least that's the explanation several people in the room who know better than, than me. But again, I love the global nature of this. I love that there was this much activity. Uh, the second number next to each of these is the number of meetings they had during the year. And um, there are just so 
I think being with 800 people here is kind of hard and exhausting for some of us. And so being with, yeah, Robert's raising his hand there. But being with 20 or 30 people in a room is perhaps a little bit more relaxing, and you can still learn some great things from the speakers. Uh, now, how many of you have been to Postgres user groups? Let me just show of hands. OK, that's good. I like that. Um, we discovered one of these through the Postgres events calendar that Andrea Sherbaum pointed me to, which was not listed on the PostgresQL.org page. And I just wanted to give a shout out to the Bangalore pug, because that's how we found out about them. All right, so now let's talk about publishing. Uh, books, blog posts, podcasts, newsletters, uh, person of the week. I mean, there's a lot of information that gets published. Uh, so there's a nice listing of books on PostgreSQL.org. These were the four that we discovered that we believe were published, either this edition or for the very first time in this time frame. So shout out to these folks. That's a ton of work. I mean, over a long, sustained period of time to pull it off and actually get to the, those printed versions. Um, we also tried to look at blog posts. Now, Planet Postgres is a wonderful syndication, a wonderful RSS feed. If you're not subscribed and you care about Postgres, then go subscribe. Um, it's a great way to keep track of lots of blog posts on this topic. However, it's just a subset because the blog posts have to be primarily open source centric. So if you're writing a blog post about RDS Postgres or Azure Database for Postgres, then those typically cannot be syndicated there. So this is just a subset, but we found that more than a thousand posts from more than 173 people. Um, we went, pulled the RSS feed and just grabbed the data and mined through it. And so this is kind of how it looks over time. And, um, and then from a, people perspective, the, the, the um, graph was way too wide to even consider putting it on a slide. So we cut it at 10 or more blog posts. And I know it's fine print on the names, but there are some people here that like David Wheeler, Bruce Momjian, Andrew Atkinson, who blog a lot. Um, and many of you have probably read what they've written. And for me, blogs are a great way to learn at two in the morning. When I can't call anybody, well, actually, I can call people in Europe, but because uh, I live in California, uh, but two in the morning when I don't want to talk to anybody and I'm in my pajamas and I'm trying to figure something out and I just, I find it a great way to learn. So, so then from a publishing perspective, obviously giving a talk, that's a form of publishing. And sometimes the talks like here are recorded. Um, sometimes people publish their slides online. And so of the 743 talks that were given at the 29 conferences, um, 397 speakers gave them. And this is the histogram that you can kind of see that distribution. So almost three or two, just over 250 gave just one talk each at these 29 events. But there were 15 people who gave six or more talks. Um, so they probably do a little bit of traveling, and obviously do a lot of work because they're not giving the same talk over and over again. I mean, for me, I, I think the most times I've ever repeated a talk is three. Um, then I move on to some new topic. So um, shout out to the folks who are what I call prolific Postgres conference speakers um, from these 29 conferences. And then we looked at countries. So what countries were these 397 Postgres conference speakers from? And uh, the data we gathered for that was, sometimes it's actually part of the person's bio profile on the, the speaker page, on the schedule page for the event. Uh, but we also used LinkedIn as a, a point of reference for figuring out where people were from. Um, but and so we have pretty high coverage. There were only eight unknown speakers where we had no idea what their current country of reference is. Obviously, sometimes people have moved in this time frame, and then it depends on the source, right? If we use LinkedIn and they haven't updated it, well, then we've got the old country. Um, if they gave the talk, um, you know, a year ago, and they've since moved, but we got it, the information from their profile, well, then we have the old country. So it's not perfect, but again, global nature of Postgres um, speakers coming together to help us all learn. All right, so then we tried to figure out, well, what companies do these 437 speakers work at? And that, that's a little tricky because people changed companies during the year. And so th what we did is we only, of course, looked at the V17 timeframe, and we only considered where they were working, according to LinkedIn. LinkedIn, excuse me, as of September 2024. Definitely need water. 
All right. So um, it's, it's kind of not a surprise that some of the bigger Postgres companies have the bigger slices of pie. I think that just makes sense from a numbers game. Um, but I also thought it was interesting that there are some small startups that show up on this list too, and that are definitely pulling their weight in terms of coming to conferences, showing up, sharing their expertise. Uh, the little tiny slices on the left-hand side, those are all the many companies who have you know, less than 1% of the total number of speakers. So that's why the slide is so noisy. Um, and then from a newsletter perspective, how many of you subscribe to Postgres Weekly? Okay, I love Postgres Weekly, sorry. It comes out every week. Um, it's published by Cooper Press. It's not affiliated or associated with any one company, nor is it part of the postgresql.org project directly, but it's super useful. Um, the editor is very inclusive and open-minded about what he includes, and I love his tone of voice when he describes like why a post matters. Or um, So uh, I just grabbed a screenshot from the most recent episode, and there it is. And then I also wanted to give a shout out to the Postgres Person of the Week um, effort that Andrea Sherbaum started more than three years ago now. And the people who took the time to submit their written interviews in this time frame are listed here. Obviously, many more people, probably some of you in this room, have also had a Postgres Person of the Week edition. I know I have, but mine was years ago. Uh, so, but shout out to Andreas and shout out to all of these folks as well. Because it's, you know, there's a lot of questions. It takes some time. You want to get it right. Um, I, and I feel like when people share their stories about why they work in Postgres, what they do, how they got here, well, that I find that really interesting, which is why we talk about that in the podcast that I, I host. All right, so now podcasts. Um, these are the four active podcasts that you can find when you go search on Postgres in all the various podcast platforms. There might be more. There was one um, that Gulchin was hosting from EDB, in fact, um, but it, it stopped after, I think, three episodes, and it was back in time, and so I didn't include it. But if there are more that I've missed, come find me afterwards and let me know. Um, obviously, Talking Postgres is the one that I co-host, but I listed them kind of in order of age. So Scaling Postgres has been around a long time and has had 330 episodes. Postgres FM, they're weekly, as is... Um, Scaling Postgres. So they also have more than 100 episodes now. Um, and uh, Talking Postgres is monthly, so fewer, uh, but definitely in this time frame. And Hacking Postgres just started uh, shortly after, shortly after mine did. And then I wanted to give a shout out to Lucas Fiddle of PG Analyze with Five Minutes of Postgres, which is a wonderful five minute video that he publishes on YouTube. Um, it feels like every week, but it's probably not exactly every week. And he'll look at something that has been published, a blog post, a new feature, a commit, and he'll talk about it and explain it. And it's really, really wonderful. So it's not a podcast. I didn't know where to put it. It's a category in and of itself. Um, and then for social posts, user group talks, right? Those speakers, those talks, those slides, um, video demos that people are publishing on YouTube, those are all incredibly valuable. And uh, we just couldn't capture that data. Uh, I wish we'd had the time. I wish we'd been able to create some automation around it. So I just grabbed a few screenshots of um, posts that were made on Twitter uh, and a recent Barcelona user group meeting just to say, hey, that work is really important too. Um, so now let's talk about engaging. Are you guys, are you with me still? Is this interesting, show of hands? Okay, thank goodness. All right, that would have really sucked. All right, um, so there's lots of ways people, users and developers and community members who are documentation writers and people like me who are trying to organize the community events, um, there's lots of ways for people to engage and communicate with each other. And the mailing lists, you know, the question I had is, are the Postgres mailing lists still a primary way to engage? And the answer is yes. So these are the numbers for the entire v PG-17 timeframe uh, that Magnus Agander pulled for us of the number of emails on each of the, these um, particular mailing lists that get used. So PG SQL hackers, 35,000 plus emails in this time frame. Um, so there's definitely a lot of communication going on here. On the other hand, uh, Tomasz Vondra, are you here, Tomasz? 
Let's see. There you are. I saw you before. Um, he gave a keynote at Swiss PG Day earlier this year, and the title of his keynote was The Past and the Future of the Postgres Community. And one of the charts that I stole from his slides uh, right here is he looked at the number of um, messages per year on the less active mailing list. And you can see that for the last 10 years, that total, when you stack those bars, has been going down. And uh, that, I mean, I don't claim to know exactly why, um, but I think what I concluded, and Tomas, would you agree, is that there has become more and more collaboration, Q&A happening in other channels with users particularly, right? Obviously, PG SQL Hackers is very active amongst the contributors, but with users, you know, the Slack, Postgres Slack has over 23,000 members right now and a lot of vigorous conversation on a daily basis. Um, Discord, I mean, I use my team uses Discord for the Talking Postgres podcast, which we record live and people can attend. But I know for a mentoring program that Robert Haas and a few others have created, they're now using a mentorship Discord for Postgres 2. And it's already up to, help me out, Robert, what's the number? Okay, 716, now that you say it, uh, members. And it's brand new. So people are collaborating in other places. Um, there's more, because of what's happened with social media as well and the fragmentation in that space, there's even more Postgres conversation happening on LinkedIn too. Uh, so there's been some changes there. So speaking of the mentoring program, um, earlier this year, after pgconf.dev, uh, Robert started a mentoring program for code contributors. And Andrea Scherbaum is involved in helping to organize it. I think Melanie Plagman was probably the inspiration for it. All the conversations about how do we, how do we help mentors become good mentors? How do we give mentees more access to um, people with the expertise they need to become a more active contributor? So the numbers that I got from Robert a week ago are that there are 10 mentors active in the program, 15 mentees, and there's the 716 people on the Discord server. Now, if any of you would like to, even though you're maybe not part of the program yet, if you would like to go join that Discord and lurk in there, and maybe participate in some of the conversations, I'm told that this query will get you an invite to the Discord. And I just cut and pasted this from uh, Robert's blog post on the topic, so I didn't make this up. All right, so now let's talk let's talk about the hack chapter. So this is where all the code and documentation contributions happen. And there is so much ground to cover here. Um, we just couldn't cover it all. So there are some bullets showing on this slide right now regarding who was involved in build farms, who was involved in the test infrastructure, uh, who was involved in the security team. Uh, we didn't get to all of that, unfortunately. But there's a lot of really valuable work that some of you in this room do and many people outside of this room. Um, but we did dive into the code itself. And when we talk about code that's changed, when we talk about commits into Postgres 17, we're talking again about both code and documentation. So here's the by the numbers chart. And I'm waiting to see how many people take pictures of it. And the answer is zero. Wow, I thought it looked really cool. All right, that's how many total commits there were. 2,680, more than 400,000 lines of code changed, 232 individual people contributed code or docs over the 16 month of changes. And we already talked about the mailing list conversation. So, so then we wonder, well, how big were the commits by the number of lines changed? People always want to talk about lines of code. So we thought, well, we have to talk about lines of code. And so this was the histogram. Um, for that, to just look at, well, what is what is that distribution? Um, no lines really trip me up. I'm like, Daniel, what does is, what is no lines of code mean? And why are there three in that bucket? But apparently there were a few commits where all that was done is an empty file was created, and that somehow generated zero lines of code on that one. Anyway, go figure. Uh, so then we wonder, well, what's the cycle time for commits? So from the time the first email discussion on a particular topic happens to when a commit lands that references that email. Um, now, the total number of 
commits on this chart is not going to add up to 2,680 because there's not a one-to-one -one correspondence. Some of the commits don't reference any email. Um, other commits reference multiple emails. So this is kind of more the cycle time for commits. It really should be titled the cycle time for emails that turn into commits eventually. Anyway, so I found the distribution kind of interesting that there were 220 same day. Like the email goes out and the commit comes in on that same day. Um, does this does this chart surprise anybody in the room? Or does it feel right? So a little bit? You get a thumbs up? Okay. What what did you say? Yes or no. It's a yes or yeah, okay. <laughs> All right. So then we looked at when was the code that was changed in Postgres 17 last modified. Um, and the 2024 number, there's a bunch of complicated reasons for why things went into 2024 and then were also modified. Um, but this, the rest of the chart didn't surprise me as much, right? Some of the more of the more recent code is more active and touched, and some of the older code barely got touched. Um, so I wanted to do a shout out to all 232 code and documentation authors in this time frame. It's really fine print, uh, but based on our work, and we had to do a lot of deduplication. You know, Ian Barwick, Ian Lawrence Barwick, Jin Wang Zhao, Zhao Jin Wang. Like there were a lot of people listed under multiple different names, and every time we scrubbed the data, we found more more duplicates. Um, so, but we we believe we landed on the right set of people and the right, the right list of names. Um, and then of those, we wonder, well, are any of them new first time code authors, code and doc contributors to Postgres? People who had never before in the history of the commit logs um, authored something. And you know, it is possible, maybe they authored something and their name wasn't properly attributed anywhere in that commit. So there d definitely could be a bunch of edge cases. But I really wanted to kind of shine a spotlight on these people. I think it's, it's wonderful, right, it, for the community to grow and evolve. Obviously, uh, people have to kind of come in and join and participate. And so uh, and it's it's kind of a nice milestone to achieve. Um, that somebody at dinner the other night was asking me, "Well, did you did you get a did you get a chart or a list of all the people f for whom this was the second release in which they've ever done a code contribution?" And we probably could grab that, but we didn't. All right. So then, how many commits did each of the 232 code or doc authors make? And so this is what that distribution looks like. Um, and so a whole bunch of people authored between one and nine commits, uh, but you can see there's there's a 27 people who authored a lot of stuff. And so then I wonder, well, who who are those 27 people? And so we grab their names. This is sorted descending by the total number of commits that they were the author for in the Postgres 17 timeframe. And again, I wish I could have put them all in here in big font, but I, I split it up this way. Um, and I included their company because, um, you know, people need to earn a living. And I think it's a good thing that companies are employing um, co contributors and committers and giving them the time to work on the Postgres open source project. All right. So then how many people involved in each commit? We don't know. We could not figure that out. Um, there. The attribution in the commits, as any of you who are familiar with the log, is a bit inconsistent. Sometimes um, the author or the reviewer is implied, but not explicit. And so we just couldn't pull that number. But what we could do is pull, well, what's the distribution of commits based on the number of people mentioned? And I, I, I found that interesting, right? That there was only a very small number that had between six and 10 people mentioned or more than 10 people mentioned. Um, and that there was a huge number at the, you know, two people. So not completely satisfying, but it was something. All right. So then what countries were the 232 code authors from? Well, we did not have good coverage on this. This is only 62.5% of the, um, the countries that those, those people are from. So it's very much an incomplete chart. What does that say? 15. All right. Um, but it still reinforces this fact that it's a global community of developers from all over the world. Um, and I think that's a good thing. Now, when it comes to committers, 
How many Postgres committers are there? The answer is 30. Um, these are listed from the, it's this, the order is the same order on the postgresql.org website. Um, it's in order of when people either did their first commit or were first added as a committer from top to bottom. And I put asterisk next to the last two names on the list to shout out to Melanie Plagman and Richard Gao, who are the two newest committers. Um, they were invited and accepted to become committers in, I think it was April 2024 of this year. So these are the folks that often are also involved in reviewing what they commit, but they're, they're committing work on behalf of other author, authors as well. So they, they do a lot of collaboration. They do a lot of helping other people, um, as well as committing their own work. Um, so that made me wonder, and this is something that Robert Haas talks about in his blog post too, how many of those commits by those committers are done on the behalf of other authors. And it, it's tricky because sometimes the committer might be a co-author and sometimes they're doing the work on behalf of other authors and they're not involved in the code at all, except as a reviewer. Uh, but we couldn't fit all the names on the list because a lot of those 30 committers did a lot of work. But we looked at anybody who had 40 or more commits and 20% or more of those were done on the behalf of others, where others might be like people that they were not involved with, or maybe they were a co-author, but they're still helping others. And so this is what that list looked like. And I think it's a really important list because um, that's just a lot of time spent helping other people, reviewing them, coaching them, guiding them, helping get it to the finish line. So thank you for that. Um, hey, hey, yeah. One, one just comment on that is just from my studies, the one thing that inflates that number artificially a little bit is often you commit something which is written by someone else, but then you have several follow up commits to fix problems which have to be done quickly. So you end up writing those yourself. So, you know, it's like if 36% of my commits were me getting other people's patches, then probably like another 20% of my commits were fixing it. Problems that occur immediately. So for the recording, I'm going to repeat the gist of that, which is that by Daniel and I made a choice to look at things by the number of commits. And sometimes there'll be like one big commit and a whole bunch of follow-on cleanup commits. And that'll count as seven commits. So the moral of the story is that commits are not equal. Some commits are big, some commits are small, some commits are fixing a typo. Like it's, it's, there's a huge range. And so when you look just based on the number of commits, you know, that, that can't be the only way you look at it because that can be misleading. That's, I used completely different words, but hopefully I summarized what, what Robert was trying to say. All right. So then we looked at what was the oldest code that was replaced in Postgres 17. And it turns out it was code from July 9th, 1996, when Mark Fournier imported the Postgres 95, like what was it, 1.0.1 distribution into the tree. And so there were 150 lines of code in Postgres 17 that either removed or changed um, those bits from Postgres 95. So we, we thought that was kind of interesting. Um, then we wondered, well, who, who's changed the oldest Tom Lane code? And that award goes out to um, Alvaro Herrera as the committer and Yelti, Yelta, Yelta, did I get it right, Floor? Yelta, Fenomenio, who I used to work with, now at Mother Duck. And uh, they made some changes to libpq. And among that, it changed this function that's called make empty con. And as it turns out, that was introduced on May 6th, 1998 by Tom Lane in his second ever patch to Postgres, which turns out was his first code patch because his first, his first previous patch um, had something to do with infrastructure and wasn't actually in the Postgres code. So that award, Yelta and Alvaro. Um, then we wonder, well, what's the oldest email? that's referred to in a Postgres 17 commit. And it turns out there was a January 2024 commit by Alexander Karatkov, who referenced this 2007 email from the late Simon Riggs. And he wrote it, it starts with, I'm starting to work on next projects for 8.4. Um, and the authors are listed in the bottom left of the page. And the feature had to do with the add new copy option on error ignore which I'm sure means something to some of you. It's in the release notes under that description. Um, so uh, we 
I don't know. I just thought it was kind of cool that Simon's fingerprints are still all over the place. And then we looked at what is the longest email thread that was tied to commits in Postgres 17. And there were 23 commits by emit, all related. Going back to Robert's point, sometimes there's multiple commits that connect to each other. And this basically had to do with logical replication enhancements. But this email that Peter Eisentrout started had 947 emails in it. So we, we thought that was kind of an interesting thing. And just shows you how much discussion there is to get to the right answer along the way. Um, so then there's a lot more contributions in this bucket that we didn't get to. Like I mentioned before, the web team, extensions. I mean, that's a whole other talk in itself. Um, several people have given talks on extensions here. I've done that in the past. Um, the infra team, error message translations, which are really, really important. Um, security, of course, that matters. So just shout out to the fact that we missed those. Now, let's talk about funding before I run out of time. Um, so I mentioned before that we all need to eat. There's an economy out there that we need to participate in. And so the companies that sponsor the work or companies that sponsor events like this, I appreciate it. Um, and so these are the logos of all of the sponsors from those 29 conferences. There are other sponsors as well of user groups, for example, that are not on this list. But I believe this to be correct. Um, and so I just wanted to kind of put everybody's name in lights. And then we also looked at adding up the total dollar amounts. Now, there were some sponsorships that are undisclosed, like there'll be a little note on a web page that says um, somebody pay, this company paid to fly a couple people to the event and they don't disclose the dollar amount. So we're missing some of those, but this is looking at those 29 events. Um, it excludes other undisclosed events like post just day. Crunchy Data runs post just day and they do not reveal how much they spend. Uh, Posette, an event for Postgres, another virtual one that, that my team runs. I know exactly how much that costs, but we did not include it because we don't reveal it. It's not publicly disclosed on the website. Um, we also excluded um, sponsorships from events that are way bigger than Postgres. So FOSDEM, for example. FOSDEM has a whole bunch of sponsors, but the Postgres and the PG Day at FOSDEM are much, much smaller part of that. So it didn't seem right. Same thing for Path Data Community Summit, which you know is a big SQL server event that has a small Postgres track. Um, if I had included the sponsorship for that, the Microsoft one would have been off the charts because Microsoft sponsors it, you know, and has for years from a SQL Server perspective. So we didn't include that as well. Um, same thing for FOSS Asia. We did not include those sponsors because it felt much, much bigger than Postgres. So this is what that looked like. And the total sponsorship dollars here, this is in euros because I'm in Europe. Um, so 763 thousand euros total across these 24 companies. And there are many more companies in the long tail off to the right that I didn't include. So, um, and then I looked at, well, which companies employ the 30 Postgres committers, um, which I didn't have enough company data to ask the same question for all 232 code authors and doc authors. Um, that, that company coverage data was just too incomplete to try to show that. Um, but for the committers, we know exactly who employs them. So I, I put those names up there and shout out to every single one of them, starting with University of Cambridge and Superbase at, Super at the bottom and going all the way to the top row. And then I put asterisks next to the committers who changed companies during this time frame, um, because that's important to know. Like, for example, uh, Richard Gao used to work at OpenPy and he's now at EDB. But a lot of the work he did in this release may have been, you know, funded by OpenPy, for example. All right. So then I mentioned these nonprofit organizations earlier. I just wanted to say that if um, they need funding, um, they do not have this amazing bank account that's out there that's like gets filled up miraculously. Um, they, the funding comes from individuals and it comes from corporations. And so I put QR codes up there for PGEU, which is behind this event, PGUS, and also PGCA, which is the board I mentioned earlier that shepherds and protects the Postgres trademark and the brand assets. So if any of you want to donate, please do. It's always welcome. And it's appreciated from those of you who have. All right. So that's the summary of everything that we talked about. 
Um, and I have a few wrap-up details, including giving a shout out to postgrescontrib.org, which is a new initiative that started after the Vancouver PGConf.dev event earlier this year, where people were talking about, gee, it would be nice to get a, more recognition. And, and we have, it. by the way, I put names up earlier for the contributors team. Um, let's see if I can remember from memory. It's Joe Conway, Melanie Plagman, and Christoph Berg. And they spend a lot of time figuring out how do we recognize people, right? How, how do we um, reward them? But this is a new initiative, and I wanted to give a shout out to all the folks whose name is on the screen for organizing it. If you're subscribed to Planet Postgres, then you should get a notification because they, they post all the new um, weekly editions on Planet Postgres. All right, so in our remaining minutes, um, I, I think after spending all this time waiting through all this data, looking at what happened in Postgres 17, I want to ask the question, like, why recognize contributions? And I think most of you in this room know that when you get recognized, it feels really good. And it also feels good when you're the person doing the recognizing. Um, I promoted somebody in this room that I'm looking at uh, this year, and it felt really good to be able to give that news. Um, so it feels good in both directions. Um, and it incents behavior. So if we want high quality, more scale growth within Postgres, then we need to think about rewarding and recognizing these, this work so that we get more of it. But you can't reward what you don't know about, what you don't see, and what you don't measure. And so that's kind of the challenge. And I would not want to go through all the work that I went through again. So when Daniel and I were talking about this, we thought, well, one thing you can do is create structure where people, all the conferences can like input the data about who was involved. Um, but you can also create a nomination program. Uh, Postgres stars, Postgres heroes, where people get nominated and reviewed and receive multiple awards every year. Or you can do both of the above. The other idea I wanted to throw out there is there's a many hats award like that we could think about giving. We're really good at recognizing the big contributions, but what about the people that wear many hats throughout the time period? And isn't that valuable too, that breadth of contribution? Um, and then before we leave, from a low-hanging fruit perspective, list your volunteers on your Postgres websites. Add your lightning talk speakers to the Postgres websites, even when it's ad hoc. Add it in the abstract after the fact, and don't delete the previous year's website for your conference so you can keep the record out there. And people get credit. They can show their boss. They can include it in their performance review. I need to thank people, especially Daniel. Um, and then I have three quick favors. How many of you have listened to Talking Postgres, the podcast? OK. Well, the rest of you have an opportunity. It's actually really cool. Um, our last guest was Tom Lane. Um, we've had a bunch of Postgres developers on recently. And I think next month we have um, uh, a person who's active in the Rails world, Andrew Atkinson, who works a lot with Rails developers. Um, I wanted to give you a heads up about Pazette. Save the date. It's happening next June. And um, if you have three minutes, there's a survey. I have 24, 34 pairs of socks that you cannot get at the Microsoft booth up here that I hand carried all the way from California. Teresa's glaring at me. Some of these are limited edition Cytoscon socks that are pre predecessors to what we now call Posette. And this is just wonderful um, Ellie Corn socks from Microsoft. So um, if you fill out this survey right now and just show me the things, I will give you these if you come up and find me or find me in the back of the room. Thank you very, very much. You guys are a great audience.